Hi, this is George Gilbert. We have an extra special guest today on our CubeCast, Aman Neymat, uh, Senior Vice President and CTO of Demandbase. Um, started with uh, um, a five-person startup, SpiderBook, and almost like a reverse IPO. Demandbase bought SpiderBook, but it sounds like SpiderBook took over Demandbase. So, Aman, welcome. Thank you. Excited to be here. Always good to see you. So, um, demand base is a next gen CRM program. Um, let's talk about just to set some context. Yes. For those who you know aren't intimately familiar with traditional CRM, um, what problems do they solve, and and uh, how did they start, and how do they evolve? Right. That's a really good question. So, you know, for the audience, I mean, CRM really started as a contact manager, right, and. It was replicating what a salesperson did in their own private sort of notebook, writing contact phone numbers in an electronic version of it, right? So you had products that were really built for salespeople on an individual basis. But it slowly evolved, particularly with Siebel, um, into more of a, a different twist. It evolved into more of a, a management tool, a reporting tool, because Tom Siebel was himself a sales manager, you know, ran a sales team at Oracle. And so it actually turned from an individual focused product to an organization management reporting product. And I've been building this stuff since I was 19. And so it's interesting that, you know, with the products today, we're going actually pivoting back into products that help salespeople or help individual marketers and add value and not just focus on management reporting. That's an interesting perspective. So it's more now empowering as opposed to sort of reporting. Right. And I think some of it is cultural influence of the, you know, over the last decade we have seen consumer apps actually take a more, much more sort of predominant position rather than, you know, uh, traditional earlier in the 80s and 90s the advanced applications were corporate applications, right? Your large computers at companies. But over the last years, consumer technology is much has taken off and actually, I would argue, has advanced more than even enterprise technology. So and in essence, yeah. that's influencing the business. So, so even ERP was a system of record, which yep. is a, the state of the enterprise. And, and this is much more um, an organizational productivity tool. Right. Okay. So, so tell us now the, the mental leap, the conceptual leap that demand base made in terms of trying to solve a different problem. Right. So, you know, demand base started on the premise or, 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 or around marketing automation and marketing application, which was around, you know, identifying who you are on, you know, as we move towards more digital transaction and web you know, web was becoming the predominant way of doing business. You know, as people say, that 70, 80 percent of all businesses start using online digital research. There was no way to know it, right? Majority of the internet is this dark, unknown place. You don't know who's on your website, you, right? You're referring to the anonymity and not exactly. knowing who is interacting with you exactly. until you, very late. And you can't do anything intelligent if you don't know somebody. Right. So if you didn't know me, you couldn't really ask what will you do. You'll ask me stupid questions around the weather, right? And really, when we it's humans, I can only communicate if you know somebody. So the sort of you know the innovation behind demand base was, and it still continues to be, to to actually bring around and identify who you're talking to, be it online, you know, on your website, and now off even your website. Um, and that allows you to have a much more sort of personalized conversation because ultimately in marketing and perhaps even in sales, it comes down to having a personal conversation. So that's really what, you know, which if you could have a billion people who could talk to every person coming to your website in a personalized manner, that would be fantastic, but that's just not possible. So how do you identify a person before they even get to... A, a vendor's website so, so that you can start you right. know, on a personalized level. Right. So demand base has been building this for a long time, but really it's a hard problem. 
and it's harder now than ever before because of security and privacy. Uh, you know, lots of hackers out there. People are actually trying to hide or at least prevent this from leaking out. So in the in the you know eight nine years ago, it was you know you, we could buy registries or reverse DNS, but now with ISPs and you know we are behind probably Comcast or Level Three. So how do you even know who this IP address is registered to? So we would you know in the about eight years ago, we started mapping IP addresses, because that's how you browse the internet, to companies that they work at, uh-huh. right? But it turned out like that was no longer effective. So we have built over the last eight year proprietary methods that you know knows how companies um, you know relate to the IP addresses that they have. But oh, we've gone to doing partnerships. So when you you know, log into certain websites. We we partner with them to identify you if you self-identify at Forbes.com, for example. So when you log in, we do a deal, and we have have hundreds of partners and data providers. But now, the state of the art where we are is we are now looking at behavioral signals to identify who you are. In so, other words, not just touch points with partners where they can. Uh, where they collect an identity, right. you have a signature of behavior. That's right. It's really interesting that humans are very unique, and based on what they're reading online and what they're reading about, you can actually identify a person and certainly identify enough things about them to know that this is an executive at Tesla who is interested in IoT and manufacturing. Ah, so you don't need to resolve down to the name level. No. You need to know sort of the profile. Persona, exactly. The persona. The persona. And that's enough for marketing, right? So if I knew that this is a C-level supply chain executive from Tesla, um, you know, who lives in uh, Palo Alto and has, you know, interest in these areas or problems, that's enough to me- for, you know, Siemens to then have an intelligent conversation to this person, even if they're anonymous on their website or if they call on the phone or anything else. So, um, okay, t- tell us the next step. Once once you have a persona, um, is it demand base that helps then uh, put together a personalized, you know, profile? Uh, profile and and lead it through the conversation. Yeah. So uh, earlier. At least, well, not earlier, but very recently, you know, we've been building this technology, which is a very hard problem to identify now hundreds of millions of people, I think around 700 business people globally, which is majority of the business world. But we realize that in AI, you know, making recommendations or giving you data and advanced analytics is just not good enough because it's, you know, you need a way to actually take action and have a personalized conversation because there are, you know, there are 100,000 people in your website making recommendations. It's just overwhelming for humans to get that much data. So the better sort of idea now that we're working on is just take the action. So if somebody from Tesla visits your website and they are an executive who will buy your product, you know, take them to the right application. If they go back and, you know, leave your website, then display them the right message in a personalized ad. So it's all about taking actions and then obviously, whenever possible, guiding humans towards a personalized conversation that will maximize your relationship. So it sounds like sometimes it's um, anticipating and recommending a next best action, and sometimes it's your program taking the next best action. Because it's, it's just not possible to scale people to take actions. I mean, we have... You know, you know, 30, 40 sales reps in, in demand base. We we can't handle the volume, and it's difficult to create that personalized letter, right? So we make recommendations, but we found that it's just too it's too overwhelming. Ah, so in other words, when you're talking about recommendations, you're talking about recommendations for demand base for or our clients, employees, or salespeople, right? Okay. But whenever possible, we're looking to now build systems that auto, uh, that in essence, are in autopilot mode, and they take the action. They drive themselves. Give us some some examples of the actions. That's right. So uh, some actions could be without, you know, if you know that a qualified person came to your website, is, you know, notify the salesperson and open a chat window saying, 
this is an executive, this is similar to a person who will buy a product from you. Mm -hmm. They're looking for this thing. Do you want to connect with a salesperson, right? And, and obviously only the people that will buy from you. Or the action could be send them an email automatically based on something that will be interested in. And in essence, have a conversation, right? So it's all about conversation and, and an ad, you know, an ad or an email or a person are just ways of having a conversation, different channels. So there was a, there was a, it sounds like there was an intermediate marketing automation generation. Right. After traditional CRM, you right. know, which That's was reporting, true. where it was basically, it didn't work until you registered on the website. That's right. And then they could email you, they could call you. Right. The inside sales reps, you, you know, right. if you took a demo, that's right. you had to put an ID in there. And that's still, you know, so when demand base came around, that was the predominant between the CRM we right. were talking about. There was a gap, there was a generation which started B2B marketing. It was all about form fills. Yeah. And it was all about nurturing. But I think that's just spam. And today their effectiveness is close to nothing. Because well, it's basically email or outbound email, calls. Yeah, it's email, spam, do you know, we all have email boxes filled with this stuff. Yeah. Right? And why doesn't it work? Because not only because it's become ineffective and that's one reason, it's because they don't know me. Right. Right. And it boils down to if the email was really good and it, it related to you, it related to what you're looking for, what, who you are, then it will be effective. But spam or generic email is just not effective. So it's, to some extent, you know, it, it, we lost the intimacy. And with the new generation of what we call account-based marketing, we're trying to build intimacy at scale. Okay, so tell us more. Tell us first the philosophy behind account-based marketing and then the mechanics of how you do it. Sure, yeah. I mean, it really, account-based marketing is nothing new. So if you walk into a corporation, they have these really sophisticated salespeople who understand their clients. And they focus on one-on-one, -on -one, you know, and, and it's very effective. So if you had Google as a client or Tesla as a client and you're Siemens, you would have two people working and keeping that relationship working because you make millions of dollars. But that's not a scalable model. It's certainly not scalable for startups here to work with or to scale your organization, be more effective. So really the idea behind account-based marketing is to um, you know, scale that same efficacy, the same uh, personalized conversation but you know, at higher volume, right? And you know, take maximize. And the only way to really do that is using artificial intelligence, because in essence, we are trying to replicate human behavior, human knowledge at scale, right? And you know, to be able to harvest and know what somebody who knows about pharma would know. So tell, give me an example of let's let's stay in pharma for a sec. Sure. And. What are the decision points where, based on what a customer does or responds to, right. you determine the next step, or demand base determines what next step to take? Right. What are some of those options? You know, like, right. a, like a decision tree. It's maybe? A, you can think of it. It's like a. Re, it's quite faddish in our industry now. It's reinforcement learning, which is what Google used in the Go yeah, system, AlphaGo, yeah. Alpha right? And we were inspired by that. And in essence, what we're trying to do is predict not only what will keep you going, but where you will win. So we give rewards you know, at each point, and the ultimate goal is to convert you to a customer. So it looks at all your possible futures and then it figures out in what possible futures you will be a customer. And then it works backwards to figure out where should you take you next. Wow, okay, so you know, this so it is can, very different from the... It plans six months ahead. So it's a planning system. Okay. Because your sales cycles are six months ahead. So um, help, us, help us understand the difference between the you know, traditional statistical machine learning that... Um, is a little more mainstream now. Sure. Then the you know the deep learning the, and the neural nets, and then reinforcement learning. Like right. Where are the sweet spots? What what are the sweet spots for the problems they solve? And yeah, I mean you know there's a lot of fat and 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 things out there. You know, in my opinion, you can achieve a lot 
and, and solve real world problems with simpler machine learning algorithms. In fact, for the data science team that that I run, you know, I always say start with like the most simplest algorithm because if the data is there and there's you have the intuition, you can get to a 60% F score or quality with the most naive uh, implementation. 60% meaning? You, like you, accuracy okay. of, of the model. Conf like confidence, confidence sure. Okay. But how good the model is, how precise it is. Okay. Um, and sure, you know, then you can make it better by using more advanced algorithms. The reinforcement learning, the interesting thing is that its ability to plan ahead. Most machine learning can only make a decision. They're classifiers of sorts, right? They say, is this good or bad, or is this blue, or is this a cat or not, right? They're mostly Boolean in nature, or you can simulate that and have multi-class classifiers. But reinforcement learning allows you to sort of plan ahead. And in CRM, or as humans, we're always planning ahead. You know, a really good salesperson knows that for this stage opportunity, or for this person in pharma, I need to invite them to the dinner because their friends are coming and we, I, and they know that last year when they did that, then in the future that person converted, right? If they go to the next stage, and they, so it plans ahead the possible futures and figures out what to do next. So um, for, for those who you know, are familiar with the term A-B testing sure, um, and who are familiar that with the notion that most machine learning models, you know, have to have to be trained on data, where you know the answer, the answer exists, mm -hmm. and then they test it out on, um, well, they they train it on on one set of data where they sure. they know the answers, then they hold some back, yeah. and test it and see if it works. Sure. So, how does reinforcement learning um, change that? I mean, it's st still testing on supervised models to know it, it can be used to derive. You need, to need still need data to understand what the reward function would be, right? And you still need to have historical data to understand what, what you should give it, and sure, have humans influence it as well, right? At some point, we always need data, right? If you don't have the data, you're nowhere, right? And, and if you don't have, but it also turns out that most of the times, there is a way to either derive the data from some unsupervised method or have a proxy for the data that you really need. So pick a key feature mm -hmm. in demand base and, and then where you can derive the data you need to make a decision, just as an example. Yeah, that's a really good question, right? We, we, we derive data all the time, right? So let me give you something quite you know, quite interesting that I wish more companies and people used is the internet data, right? The internet today has, is the largest source of human knowledge and it actually knows more than we could, you could imagine. And even simple queries, so we use the Bing API a lot, right? And to know, so one of the simple problems we ran into many years ago, and that's when we realized how we should be using internet data, which in academia has been used, but not as, and it's not as used as it should be. So, you know, you can buy APIs from Bing, and, you know, I, I wish Google would give their API, but they don't. So, you know, that's our next best choice. Um, we wanted to understand who people are. So there's, you know, their common names, right? So George Gilbert is a common name, or Alan Fletcher, who, who is my co-founder. and. You know, is that a common name? You know, um, and if you search that, just that name, if you get that name in various contexts or co-occurring with other words, you can see that there are many Alan Fletchers, right? Or if you get, you know, versus if you type my name, Amon Naimit, you will always find the same kind of context. So you'll know it's one person or it's a unique name. So it sounds to me that like reinforcement learning is online learning. Um, where you're you're using context, it's not perfectly labeled data. Right. And I think there is no perfectly labeled data. So there's a misunderstanding of data scientists coming out of perfectly labeled data courses from Stanford or whatever machine yeah. learning program. 
And we realized very quickly that the world doesn't have any perfect label data. Then we think we are going to crowdsource. We are going to crowdsource that data. Right. And it turns out we've tried it multiple times, and after years, we realized that it's just a waste of time. You can't get you know twenty cents or twenty five cents per item worker somewhere and wherever to ha label data of any quality to you. So it's much more effective to. And we were a startup, so we didn't have money like Google to pay. And even if we have the money, it generally never works out. Um, we find it more, more, co more effective to bootstrap or use unsupervised models to actually create data. Help, help us uh, elaborate on that. Yeah. The unsupervised and, and, and the bootstrapping, where maybe it's sort of like a lawnmower where you give it that first That's right. you know, <laughs> tug. I mean, yeah. we have used it extensively. So let me give you an example. Let's say you wanted to create a list of cities, right? Um, or a list of the classic example, actually, was a paper written by Sergey Brin. Yeah. I think he was trying to figure out the names of all authors in the world, and this is 1998, right? And it basically, if you search on Google, the term, you know, um, has written the book. Yeah. Right. Just the term has written a book. These are called patterns, or Hearst patterns, I think. Um, then you can imagine that it's also pre always preceded with a name of a person who's an author, and you know, so you know, George Gilbert has written the book, and then the name of the book, right? Or William Shakespeare has written the book X, and you seed it with William Shakespeare, and you get some some books, or you put Shakespeare, and you get some authors, right? And then you get you use it to learn other patterns that also co-occur between William Shakespeare and the book, you know. Uh, and then you learn more pattern patterns, and you use it to extract more authors. And in the case of demand base, that's how you go from uh, learning, starting bootstrapping within, say, pharma terminology, yes, and learning the rest of pharma, pharma. Term terminology. and then uh, using genetic terminology to enter an industry and then learning terminology that we ourselves don't understand yet it means like you know for example I always use this example where you know if we read a sentence like Takeda has in licensed a molecule from you know Roche it may mean nothing to us but it means that they have partnered and bought a, a, a product right in in pharma lingo so we use it to to learn new language, and, and it's a common technique. We use it extensively, both. So, you know, it goes down to, while we do use, you know, highly sophisticated algorithms for some problems, I think most problems can be solved with um, simple models and, you know, thinking through how to apply domain expertise and data intuition and having the data to do it. Okay. Let's pause on that point and come back to it because that sure. sounds like a, a, a rich vein to explore. Um, so this is George Gilbert on the ground at Demandbase. We'll be right back in a few minutes.